Hello and welcome back. This is Fresh Takes 12 with Dr. Mark Wagner, where we take a look at some health news and uh, unpack it a little bit. Today we have an article uh, we found on The Guardian. Uh, says sleep should be dis uh, prescribed what those late nights could be costing you. So it's specifically about sleep. It's a wealth of information. Mark, I'll uh, hand it to you and take it from there. Yeah, so this is a great article. I'm glad you brought it to my attention. And it was written about a year and a half ago. And the the interviewee, so Matthew Walker, PhD, is who is being interviewed in this article. And he's the author of what has since become a runaway international bestseller, the book, Why We Sleep. And um, it's interesting that this book should be such a bestseller because uh, Dr. Walker is not here to whisper sweet nothings in your ear about just drinking chamomile tea and getting some warm baths at night. I mean, he is on a mission and he uh, really phrases things very clearly. He's British. He uses the English language so well, very eloquent. But he says things like, this is a catastrophic sleep loss epidemic we're in right now with powerful links to Alzheimer's disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, and poor mental health. So this guy's not messing around. So it's a hard message. So it's interesting that it's resonating. And I think one of the reasons it's resonating is because people can feel that it is true. And, and it actually matches the... Uh, the historical facts, because it, in 1942, only 8% of the population was trying to survive on less than six hours of sleep a night. Now, fast forward to 2017, we're in 2019, I realize that, but in 2017, when it was last measured, almost 50% of people are trying to survive on six hours or less of sleep a night. So that's, that's like every other person, every other person you talk to is trying to survive on less than six hours of sleep. And I think we're all beginning to feel it. This is historically abnormal in epic proportions, and we're beginning to feel it. So you have a well-written, well-researched book that meets a time in history where people are feeling this is true. And um, so why would it be that we're getting so much less sleep than at any other time in history? Um, well, some of the reasons that Dr. Walker points out is that we've for starters, we've simply electrified the light, uh, excuse me, electrified the night like never before. Yeah, and that electric struck lights me actually, you're right, about, about that. I was, I remember growing up and my grandparents lived in the foothills of Northern California and they had a small place with, you know, no TV, not a lot of entertainment. And so every summer we'd go visit them for a couple of weeks and at the end of the two weeks, it was like emerging from a different world where everybody was well rested and uh, it's just like going back in time. So I can't help but think part of that was the amount of sleep that we got there. Yeah, you were probably, there was probably no light pollution out there. So when it got dark, it was dark. They probably, you know, didn't have a ton of lights on. And if they did, they were the, you know, incandescent yellow spectrum lights instead of the LED bright blue lights that retard melatonin release. Or just firelight, yeah, you know, which is what our species has been around since A and yay, right? That's what we're programmed, that's what we're adapted for. So now we have all these bright blue screens that we're staring at either for entertainment or for doing work late into the night. Um, we've but speaking of that's another reason why we're not sleeping as much. We blurred the boundary between our work life and our home life because we have all these intrusive devices, and the expectation is you should be able to be reached at any time to do something. Um, so we never really wind down. We sort of feel like we're on call. Um, uh, we have longer commute times even when we are quote unquote on the clock. So we work for eight hours and we spend two hours in the car on top of that. So by the time we get home, the last thing we want to do is just go straight to bed because we haven't had our family time or our wind down time or our entertainment time. So what happens there is in order to get that time, we push that later into the evening. And so, yeah, there's all kinds of reasons. There's more anxiety these days. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And one of them is just sleep itself. Short sleep causes anxiety and anxiety causes short sleep. So it's a vicious cycle. You start sleeping shorter, you start having more anxiety, you have more anxiety, you have more insomnia. So there's that. Um, there's also a good data to show that people report feeling lonelier and more isolated and depressed. Uh, on average than in previous uh, decades, probably because we spend so much less time connecting with real people and so much more time connecting with digital avatars of people. 
And, um, and then alcohol and caffeine are more widely available than they've ever been before. And at, at younger and younger ages, partic particularly caffeine, which is a serious uh, wrecker of sleep. Um, we can talk about maybe the mechanisms of that or not. I think most people uh, are aware. And even if you're not caffeine sensitive, if you're one of those people who says, oh, I can drink caffeine and go right to sleep, it's been demonstrated time and again on polysomnograms, which are electrical encephalograms for uh, looking at sleep architecture, is that caffeine before bed, whether or not it keeps you awake, will still disrupt your sleep architecture. So the electrical quality of your sleep is not as good, even if you are, even if you can quote unquote go to sleep after a caffeinated beverage. And then last but not least, we have created in the last 60 years a real culture around this idea that sleep is for the weak. And I don't know where this came from, but sleep is really stigmatized now by public figures from sports heroes, even all the way up to the people who occupy the highest office in the land. Yeah, the thing this that, is new. that struck me that, that was totally proof of that, that when he brought up the notion in the article of that you would never tell a baby that uh, they're lazy for sleeping too much, but for adults, it's totally accepted as a fact. And if you're if you're ambitious and you're on a uh, competitive project at your workplace, if you complain that you'd had to come in late for a meeting because you needed to make your sleep or mark time for sleep, uh, that wouldn't wouldn't go well. You'd get insulted. Right. So so this is historically abnormal too. It's kind of crazy. And you know, uh, Dr. Walker has a great quote in here. I'm trying to find it. Yes, he says humans are the only species that deliberately deprive themselves of sleep for no apparent reason. <laughs> and it goes on to uh, elucidate studies that show that the number of people who can actually survive on five hours of sleep or less without any impairment expressed as a percent of the population and rounded to a whole number is zero. Like that's just the truth. And so we have you know, we have people in high-powered positions in this country, you know, beating their chest about how they only need five hours of sleep, and they have a lot of influence on other people. And so if the idea is the only way you can crush it out there and get things done is to, um, you know, get five hours of sleep a night, that's a bad message. Uh, because it turns out the facts are the shorter you sleep, the shorter your life, and also the worse your mood and mentation while you're alive. So adults 45 years or older who sleep less than six hours a night are 200% more likely to have a heart attack or stroke in their lifetime as compared with people who are sleeping seven or eight hours a night. Yeah, and so then there's, yeah, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. Blood pressure is one. Just getting a good night's sleep is, is, is better than a blood pressure pill for many people. And then there's the effects on uh, blood glucose control. So not sleeping, and we've talked about this in previous episodes, that not sleeping really hijacks the body's uh, effective control on blood sugar. So you become less responsive to insulin, which leads to obesity and diabetes, which are killers. And the satiety signals get screwed up. So your, your leptin, your satiety hormone goes down, your ghrelin, your, your greedy eat, eat hormone goes up. And so all this time we've been blaming processed food and sedentary lifestyles as the sum total of what's wrong. And, and, but, but the thing is, is there's this third thing that we need to include in explaining the rise of obesity, and it's sleep loss. Because it affects your hormones for appetite. It affects your ability to um, manage glucose. And, and so it's huge. Um, so... And its effect on Alzheimer's is totally demonstrable as well. So, so there are good studies now that show not only association data, but cause and effect data. And just one night of sleep, uh, one night of poor sleep in volunteers, and I don't know who volunteered to do this, but so in volunteers that, that, that volunteered to have a lumbar puncture to measure the amount of, of, of beta amyloid in there, which is a marker, it's one of the markers for Alzheimer's disease, the amount of beta amyloid in their CSF, their cerebral spinal fluid, went up after just one night of really bad sleep. Because it turns out that there's this whole system called the glymphatic system. You've heard of your lymphatic system, and that's just sort of like your garbage disposal system in the body that drains away um, garbage proteins and things like that. Well, there's a system analogous to that in the brain. It's called the glymphatic system. And it's this wonderful system that's only recently been discovered and outlined in which all uh, the space between the cells actually enlarges. So the, the structural cells of the brain shrink at night, but only under conditions of deep, slow-wave sleep. 
they shrink and they allow the pathways between the cells to open up and debreed. So um, they allow these dangerous compounds like amyloid beta um, to flow out and get removed. And so if you're not sleeping, if you're not getting sleep, the, the deep restorative sleep, you're, that's not happening. It would be almost like, this is an analogy that Dr. Walker, Dr. Walker uses, is that it would be almost like um, if in our cities, like you imagine New York, where all of the buildings at night shrunk by 200%, and allowed all of the space between them to open up and be used for garbage disposal and then go back. And that's what's happening in the brain if you get deep sleep. And if you don't, you don't. And so, yeah, so there's a huge um, mechanistic link there, um, let alone the, the association links over time between poor sleep and Alzheimer's disease. So that's another thing. And then there's mood, right? Sleep is the best overnight therapy we can think of for mental health because loss of REM sleep, which you, you which you tend to have mostly um, in the later hours of of the of the of your sleep cycle, so bef before waking, so you if you lose REM sleep, you lose emotional regulation, and any parent of a four-year-old knows this, right? You build your whole life around their nap schedule. And the only difference between a four-year-old and a 40-year-old is your coping skills. Because if you're 40 and you get crappy sleep, you feel like a four-year-old that's about ready to throw a tantrum. You just have better coping skills. So it's, so, so it ho hopefully, but, but the thing is, is that the, what's happening physiologically is the same. It doesn't change just because you grew up. And then there's your, there, there's your mentation that gets um, really uh, Im impaired here. And so so after being awake for 19 hours, it's been demonstrated that you are as cognitively impaired as someone who is legally drunk, which has all kinds of implications for people who are like long haul truck drivers, who fly airplanes, um, who do operations in the hospital on delicate procedures. Like this, in other words, this is why this book is so urgent is because we have a whole culture who's ignoring this and it's having implications every day. People are dying that don't need to be dying and people's quality of life is being impaired that doesn't need to be impaired because of this. Two thirds of the adults in the developed nations um, will fail to obtain the nightly eight hours of sleep that is now recommended by the World Health Organization because the World Health Organization has now called sleep or excuse me, uh, shift work as a probable carcinogen. And we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, so an adult, and, and here's some other facts. An adult sleeping only uh, 6.75 hours a night would be predicted to live only into their early 60s without medical intervention based on what we know now. And in 2013, this will get your attention. In 2013, a study reported that men who slept too little had a sperm count 29% lower than those who regularly get a full and restful night's sleep. And, and that was actually reflective of their testosterone levels. So, you know, here's all these guys running around. It's like, we're, we're looking at our laboratory data and how we feel and we're like, man, you know, my testosterone's low. I need to find a doctor to pres prescribe some testosterone cream or get a special supplement for it. And it's like, no, you need to get to bed, you know? go down so you can get it up. I mean, this is like, right? It's like fundamental elementary Watson. So, and then this is, this is really scary. If you drive a car when you've had less than five hours of sleep, you are 4.3 times more likely to be involved in a crash. And if you've had only four hours, of, four hours of sleep, you are 11.5 times more likely to be involved in, in an accident. So, so yeah, so that's uh, immediate dangers of sleep loss let alone all the long-term ones we just um, talked about. So, you know, what should you do? Well, avoid all-nighters if you're a student. There's no reason to do that. It totally jeopardizes your ability to, uh, uh, to convert short-term memory into long-term memory. It will completely backfire on you. Um, schools, um, this is according to the article, schools should consider a later start times uh, so that we are educating our, our best and brightest individuals in their best and brightest mode of being so that they are awake. You should have an alarm to go to bed instead of an alarm to get up. And you should definitely avoid sleeping pills because sedation is not sleep. And this is huge. So you can see this if you actually do polysomnograms. If you look at the electrical activity of the brain, for someone who is sedated, 
it's garbage. It's completely not restorative sleep they're getting versus the um, sleep of a polysomnogram of a person who gets natural sleep. So sedation is not sleep, and that's a huge thing I want to drive home. Um, you should get a really strong light signal and a really strong dark signal at the right times of the day. So go outside, get full spectrum light in the morning before noon on your eyeballs, and that sends a strong wakefulness signal to the brain. And then you need a strong dark signal in the evenings to get to have the melatonin system come online so that you can start initiating the sleep sequence. Uh, there are blue blocker glasses you can get uh, to if you're watching, you know, for watching television or screens, you're being in, if you have to be doing that in the evening. Um, because the blue blocking, the blue light is the is is the light that blocks the release of melatonin. So there are blue blocking lights. There are uh, programs on on your computer that can change the spectrum into the red spectrum. And on your phone, if you have an iPhone, there's the what's called a night shift mode. So highly recommend you use that. And then last but not least, if you get into your bedroom at night, it needs to be pitch black, and it needs to be cool. Because uh, your core temperature has to drop by about one degree Celsius for you to really sleep well. And those are some some of the best tips out there uh, that at least were in this article, and I would su support them. Uh, you know, Dr. Walker practices what he preaches. I'll, I'll read you this uh, final quote from him. He says, I give myself a non-negotiable eight-hour sleep opportunity every night, and I keep very regular hours. If there's one thing I tell people, it's to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, no matter what. He says, I take my sleep incredibly seriously because I have seen the evidence. Once you know that after just one night of only four or five hours of sleep, your natural killer cells, the ones that attack cancer cells in your body every day, drop by 70%, or that the lack of sleep is linked to the cancer of the bowel, prostate, and breast, or even that even just that the World Health Organization has classified any form of night shift work as a probable carcinogen, how else, or how could you do anything else but get your sleep? So to answer the question, should sleep be prescribed? Probably yes. Um, it's, enjoy it's enjoyable. It costs you nothing. It will not only save your life, but it will in, you know, greatly improve the quantity, or excuse me, quality of your life. And um, I can certainly vouch for that. You know, uh, I'll just give you, I'll just tip my hand a little bit here. So this morning, you know, I called you. We were supposed to record this two hours ago. And, and I, I called you because I said, God, I, I, I slept terrible last night. In fact, this is going on eight nights in a row of, of bad sleep because um, I overdid it in yoga a week ago and injured my shoulder, re-injured it, and I've been sleeping like crap at night because the pain keeps me awake. And I was having such a hard time getting going this morning. I had to drink extra coffee. I took, you know, adaptogens, everything, just to try to show up this morning. But that's not how you want to be living. So if something is getting in the way of your sleep, you need to really address it. And you know, for me right now, that's a musculoskeletal pain issue, but it could be sleep apnea for you. It could be all of the other just behavioral issues we went over just now and, and the expectational issues. So it runs the gamut between taking you know, responsibility for yourself, but also what needs to change in our wider culture in terms of attitudes, societal structures, schools, start times. Um, uh, boss attitudes, the whole thing needs to change for us to be even normal, to go back to what it was even normal just 60 years ago and 200,000 years ago. So yeah, I think we're, we've reached a, a place in history where sleep is going to have to be prescribed in order for us to kind of get back to normal. That's great. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>